be um, on uh, budget 2023 changes in CPF contributions. And the second topic would be on support measures for employee. And the last topic would be on progressive wage credit. And all these are the changes that is um, announced during the budget 2023. And after that, we'll have a short question and answer session. Once that's done, then we'll have, um, last but not least, we'll have Easy Pay Update by Lenny Janwa, which is our product manager. Okay. Um, our speakers for today will be Anil Lawani. Anil has more than 18 years of legal experience as both in-house counsel and as a legal practitioner. He's a solutions provider and a problem solver focused on employment law, business law, company law and contracts, drafting business agreement and resolving court, uh, court disputes. With Anil, it's always more than just the law. He loves dealing with accounting and financial statements. Ultimately, Anil strives to be the trusted advisor to his clients and their organizations, equipped to manage risk and navigate change. Okay, so with that, we'll start off uh, with Anil. So um, over to you, Anil. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Can everyone hear me? I yep, assume we can hear you well. If everyone can hear me loud and clearly, I know it's raining in my end, I don't know about your end. And if you're wondering and looking at my photograph and you're saying this gentleman has got black hair and he now looks with white hair. Let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you what exactly happened. I went to consider this very carefully to fit into this particular role today to describe all the budget changes, I thought I'd dye my hair white. Well, if that is not good enough to persuade you, then maybe a more persuasive way of doing this is to tell you, I went for three jabs and my color from black all became white. Not enough? Not persuasive enough? Well, the truth of the matter is, the budget has had so much of impact on so many people post-COVID. It makes you think and wonder what else is going to happen. And I'll start off by telling you a little story. There is this particular gentleman in 1955, in his early 20s. His name is Ang Chi Hock. Ang Chi Hock considered that his whole life was about going fishing, playing kites, and doing everything that was related to having fun in 1955. And in 1955, the mood was, there was no governance, there was no issue. Yet, in 1955, anyone who worked in Singapore were then offered CPF at contributions of 5% for each employer and employee. So for Ang, um, it was very easy. Ang um just saw this as saving his money for 5% and the government will contribute the other 5%. But then guess what happened? The percentages increased from 5 to 10. And then it increased to a certain percentage and dropped after the financial crisis in 1998. And slowly, progressively, CPF has been going up. CPF contributions have been going up. What would you think Ang was thinking at all of this time? I'll tell you what Ang was thinking. Initially, he said, small amount to contribute, no problem. Now I have to put on more. Why? Then there was the financial crisis where the government lowered the CPF contribution. In 1986, there was another problem and that was Singapore went through a recession. So can you imagine that the CPF contributions that we've been talking about is actually a roller coaster ride, starting from the lowest of 5% for an employee to 10% and then going up increase and then coming down and now more changes to the CPF contributions. Can I just pick your mind why 
why do you think the government has been playing and twitching your CPF contributions? Why? Well, let me tell you. The number one reason has been, has been an aging population. More is needed to save your money. But your question is, but why? I can save my own money. Why do I need the government to help me save my money? Two, more and more people needing protection as employees. So you will see as we discuss, as we get down this uh, seminar today, of the impact and the thread that lines all of this is actually CPF. So when we go through the support measures for employees, we go through the progressive wage credit for employees, and we go through CPF contribution changes, you will suddenly realize that there is a common thread. And the common thread is making sure that employees can survive in this difficult environment. So let me start off by, start by stating the obvious. Our learning objective today <clears throat> is not the, the information that is all going to be shared with you here alone. Our learning objective as HR practitioners, as HR uh, uh, process claims, uh, payment claim processors, and as business owners has to be, what is the impact I have today that I can plan for the future of how to manage this? And the number one expectation that we will have here must be the expectations of the employees who need to understand why I have all these changes, what does it make a difference to me? Because at the end of the day, the employee will say, yeah, I've got my money, why bother? Why does it matter? Well, it matters how you plan. And that's how our starting position of how Ang would have progressed through this story. So let me start off by telling you the changes to CPF. So, let's start with the most obvious. Let's start with the most obvious. And that is the increase in the CPF monthly salary ceiling. What does that mean? What does this actually mean in terms of impacting the employees? If you don't already know, right, there is a ceiling as to the amount of which your CPF contribution is tabulated. What is that figure? Up until today, it is $6,000 ordinary wages. Okay, what does that mean? All it means is that if you earn more than $6,000 per month, your CPF cap is capped at 6000 This is common knowledge to everybody. Every practitioner should know this. And if it isn't, it's not an issue. It's already uh, regulated. They won't take more than this. But what happens from September 2023? From September 2023, I no longer have 6000 I have 6300 Guys, what happens here? It means that the person who used to be able to just stop at $6,000 would now need to ensure that he has a higher amount of the salary ceiling that he is to keep aside because that's what his CPF will be based on. It also means that employers are now going to be faced with having to pay out more. Obvious, right? Also, for the employees, what happens? It also means that as employees, I don't get to take back more money 
How can this be fair? How in the world can this be fair if I as an employee am unable to earn uh, take back more cash when the whole idea for me was to be able to take more money back home? Of course, employers will complain. They will say, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. This is really unfair because who's going to pay for this cost? Guess what? They've thought about this. They've, they've thought about this. What have they thought about? They have decided and if you don't see the numbers already, let me just tell you what the, what the screen that you see in front of you tells you. The easiest to see is $6,000 by 2026, right? A few years from now, three years to be exact, if I count 2026 January, it will mean that at $8,000, I will have now an additional $600 to pay. And therefore, that impact is there. Now, if you see the other side, the annual salary ceiling, that is another component called the additional wage. So what they're trying to do is that they're breaking down ordinary wages at additional wages so that ultimately there is a cap of $102,000 on your annual salary uh, ceiling. Um, the numbers are not important. What is important is that the impact it will have on, your, on the way you prepare your modules the way that you prepare your, your itemized building, all of this will have to change to reflect the changes. And the changes will come now. September 2023, you've got to be ready to tell somebody now that your CPF amount is going to change. And you'll be able to explain to the employees in advance, not wait until after the things have happened to have caused this issue. So just bear that in mind while we discuss uh, the, the next uh, uh, point, right? Now, let me now share with you what it means for employees by way of a short video on this particular uh, uh, point. Malin, there's no volume. Malin, the video is going on, but there's no volume. Uh, please bear with me, everyone. some technical issue it seems Ivan Malin anyone able to assist with the volume if not we'll move on to the next video and talk about it apologize for the technical it shouldn't have been but hey no issue sometimes these things happen let me now take you to the to the next guys may be relatively clear now are you, you ready for the storm the future may bring well, the bigger our umbrella, the more protected we will be. Which is why Budget 2023 will push us to save up more for a rainy day. We already have an umbrella. No. Okay. Some parts of it, the short of it, you probably must have heard already. The short of it is, it just tells you that it is to save for a rainy day. Now, with, it's ironic, it's raining today. And if you want to save for a rainy day, um, I had some questions and issues with this because ultimately I take home a lesser amount. So how does this save me for a rainy day? Well, in your reserve account, in your, in your retirement account, you will probably have more money. Why is that relevant? Because Singapore is having older people and that's basically the reason why as we have older generation of people living in our in our midst in our way that we deal with our life in the way that we change our lives you can imagine why there will be a need to go and focus on on uh, the older generation the people who are going to be older and 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 as you have a situation like this where are you going to find the money to fund them especially if healthcare is becoming expensive these are arguments that, of course, the minister, the government has put forth to you. But let me ask myself this other question. What is the direct impact to an employee? You know what? The answer is going to be, Hi, uh, 
I cannot take back. So already so difficult to take my money back home to be able to cater for the household expenses. And I now have to take out less, uh, take home less. This is really unfair. Understandfully, this will be something that would typically occur to you. It would occur to me. But does that also mean that there's an opportunity for us to increase our salary wages? Because that would mean that we get above a certain amount. Previously at $6,000, you said this is comfortable. This is no longer comfortable. Because at some point of time, you would have to move in a very, very slow pace in to increase your wages of your employees. So you really have to think about the, what the balance will be. Uh, it could be a more expensive employment uh, 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 employee working with you, but at the same time, we know that he's been protected. Let me explain now the next portion in which we talk about um, older, work, older wages. Uh, if you're able to get to increasing CPF contributions for senior workers and providing a CPF transition offset for employers, this is directly from the Minister himself. Prime Minister himself explained this. Are we able to play this? Okay, so if I could literally show you what it is, retirement age is moving up from 62 to 65, and then there's a re-employment age. If you all are not familiar with these two concepts, this is something we have to deal with immediately. If you have a retiring person who's coming of a certain age, he has to be included in your computation of a workforce. There are certain criteria, it's a different seminar altogether if I, if I spoke to you about it. But in short, what is very urgent in this particular situation is identifying who has reached a certain age of 63 and what is it that you are proposing for him, what is the circumstances that you have available and what is the arrangement you have for him. As long as he's able to work, he satisfactory performs, he is basically considered for an automatic mandatory uh, 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 re-employment. So, of course, this refers to Singaporeans. I'm talking about Singaporeans and PRs here. I'm not talking just about any particular worker in your system. This is purely to look after the, the, the aging population in Singapore and looking after the employers. Right, now, let me now just tell you this particular table, which um, it's, it's a good way for us to explain having the technical issue okay I think in the interest of time and and because the videos are not playing out properly let's just take the position that we're able to explain this uh, I, I do apologize to everyone that this is uh, this, this is occurred it didn't occur earlier but you know sometimes you never know so perhaps I can I can take this position from looking at at, at at this table. If everyone is with me, I have a thumbs up. Everyone, I don't get a reaction, so I don't know. But but I imagine that uh, that y'all are able to hear me clearly, and and it's you're able to understand what I'm saying in relation to each of these changes. Yes. So I, I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue because it's necessary as HR managers and HR practitioners to understand exactly what the impact is. You probably already know this, but let me put it out straight out for you. What is it? What is the current position at the moment? Everybody should know this. We have a total wage out of 37%, which doesn't change if you're 55 and below, right? How is this done? An employer will have to contribute 20% of that. An employee Sorry, let me say that correctly. An employer will have to contribute 17%. An employee will have to contribute 20%. It means that out of a thousand, uh, $2,000, you would have to take out 20% uh, of that, right? $400 of that of your money goes into. This is common knowledge. Now, what happens here? If you're above 55 to 60, um, 55 to 60, 
your current total wage drops from 37 to 29.5. Makes sense, makes sense. Why? Because at 55, CPF gives you a certain amount beyond your minimum requirement, right? Minimum uh, retirement sum and tells you that you can withdraw this. So I suppose is to say, fine, you can enjoy some bits of your retirement. Um, but those who don't retire, what do they do? Then they have this particular percentage. They, the rates will change according to the 15 and 16 percent, not very significant, 55 to 60, we're going to have this group of people joining, right, um, in, a, in a very short period of time. At above 60 to 65, the percentage drops even further. Now, any, no guess, right? Can you imagine why we're doing this? Right? Does anyone have a reason or an explanation as to why we would be able to, to to reduce from 60 to 70. Why the intention is there? Because if it's not a read in your mind, it is to encourage more people who are older, the senior category of people to join in the workforce and know that they will be able to have certain amounts saved. Now, it also ensures that employers are also not obligated, right? Because effectively, Previously, I had to take out 17% and now I don't have 17% to deal with. I have a much lower percentage, 15%, 11.5% as I get older and up to age 70, even 9%. Now, what is this change for, right? Because previously, I would have not had a situation in which the amounts would have been very different. So if I could just summarize this little table from just looking at 55 all the way down to 65 and 70. Now, if my current position is very high, 37, 29.5, 20.5, 15.5, 12.5, what does it do? It doesn't encourage enough people to come back to the force. And so that's why they tweeted the amount. So the total wage percentage, if you look at the numbers, 37 before 55, 31, 22, 60 above, I'm trying to encourage more people to come back. 65 to 70, granted, most people cannot, you know, um, work to their maximum, but would like the flexibility to work. Hence, I increase this uh, option to, to, to encourage more people to come back. Above 70, it's a, your guess as good as mine. They anticipated that probably above 70, less people will want to work. So they left these numbers unchanged. I think it's fair. But it also means the scope of that work is also reduced because how many people in that 70s age will be able to fit in? Many people then become what we are going to talk about later, platform workers, right? They, they, they do deliveries, uh, they write graphs, they do, they drive Gojeks. Why? Variety of reasons, flexibility being the most important. Let me now move to this um, next slide of how does it benefit the organization and how you as a practitioner need to be uh, concerned about. So this is how the CPF transition offset benefit uh, works, right? So I'm trying to look after employers from a financial perspective. This is what uh, DPM Lawrence Wong had mentioned in parliament and his intention in parliament was very straightforward. All he said was, he said that the purpose of this exercise is to ensure that we have an inclusive society. The purpose is to have a forward thinking. And in fact, he never said that it was the best budget. You know, there was no people, there were no people coming out to clap and go, whoa, bravo, what a book. No, it was understood that this was going to have an impact on the future. And the future here would mean that I understand I have an aging population. In fact, the video that I wanted to show you earlier would have shown very clearly that when I talked about, when we, when we speak about um, uh, an aging population, there is now this situation where the aging population has accelerated. It's faster in Singapore. More and more people are getting older. More and more, more, and more people are requiring healthcare. More and more people are requiring a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 support because they cannot manage on their on their own to some extent it's uh, there is an answer to that if we, we're not producing enough people in singapore to sustain but hey i think that's a worldwide problem now let me just share this point with you right guys the 
the the point about the transition offset of 50% each year is intended to do one thing which is to allow a short term repair of the uh, the cost that will be faced by a lot of employers so short of the thing is employers will be provided with a wage equivalent to 50% in the increase of the employer cpf rates for every singaporean and pr and that's where we are and they have to be employed between the ages of above 55 to 70 the message is very clear this is something as hr practitioners please remember the moment somebody hits a certain age of 55 you need to remember whether you are entitled to all the wages so if you are writing anything down right you're just remembering these few points right you're remembering immediately that look there is an eligibility for all my employees who hit 55 and above many of you may already have uh, in your teams but it's a good point to record ah okay this is what i need to look check to see whether they qualify and they're singaporeans and prs and that's important right so who's eligible employers who employ local employees 55 70 and who have made remember the one line i told you that was consistent timely mandatory cpf contributions for the employee because there are some employers some bizarre reasons do not contribute there are repercussions we'll talk about it some other time or maybe we'll address them in questions if necessary so how does it work let me just tell you this there is a table that I would like to just show you now in my next slide. Okay, so less than 55, no issue, but the moment you hit 55, you obviously understand. 55 to 60, what happens is that if I increase someone's salary by 0.5%, the CTO or the, the, the transition offset will be 50% of that. So 0.25% point. The mathematics of this, I think, is no challenge. It's quite easy. What they're saying is 50% of it will be paid off. 55 to 70, this is the number you must have in your head. If at all, uh, you, you need to remember anything else, okay? Um, there is, of course, uh, uh, you could scan your QR codes and check for eligibility and request for breakdown for the for CTO. All of this is actually automated. I, I, I show you in my next slide exactly what it is right you you can if you want to to just test to see right okay so what what is important in relation to this table is to take note when it comes into effect if you look at it uh, the increase in employer CPF contribution is from 1st of January 2024. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are already two dates as HR practitioners you need to have in your mind. The first, September 2023, right? What is that? CPF ceiling increasing to 6,301. Two, this in relation to if you have workers above 55 to 70 there will be a change in their cpf contributions working and affecting you so please ensure that you check to see whether you can get the transition back um, of the government paying 50 percent back to you there are going to be questions about how this process work and procedure i will address them in a few minutes now after we get into this uh, second uh, uh, next slide right Okay, so short process of how this works um, and I will just go through this with you so that you have it in your mind. Technically speaking, you don't have to do much but good for you to understand how this works. Um, there is this concept of an additional wage that is being introduced. I think it's very important uh, that you all understand that there is a distinction between ordinary wages and additional wages, but we'll come to that in a couple of minutes. So let's start with the CPF transition, how it's calculated, right? Um, what's done, what is done is I first determine the age and how is the age determined? It is the age of 31st December of the year preceding 55. That means I don't wait until your birthday. I assume that the time you turn, you turn 55 will be just the year before 
uh, in that particular year. So, for example, if 2023 I turn 55, uh, I'm looking at it to calculate it from the year before. Yeah. So that's how the the, the, the calculation will be. It's the 31st of December of the year preceding the year in which you turn 55, right? Then I would have to calculate your additional wage ceiling. So what is additional wage ceiling? Ah, so my ordinary wage ceiling is what I typically use as my salary to calculate my wages salary each time, each month. But my additional wage salary would be things like bonus, overtime, allowances, um, certain special benefits that are given to you. Okay, uh, that are subject to CPF contributions. So, why do we do that? Because of course the government don't want to overpay you. So what they want to do is, they want to be able to calculate your CPF offset by minusing away your additional wages. So your, what would happen is, in order to calculate, I need to take, I need to take the CPF transition offset, which will be a certain amount, right? Um, you're, you're calculating your total wages for that particular year and then taking a percentage of that, 0.25. Let me just get this corrected. When I have to determine my total salary, my wage is going to be based on the difference between my total minus my ordinary. That's uh, the, the, the calculation. Okay, so if you see that note over there in the bottom point one, I'm going to show you now. You will see that what is my additional wages is actually the difference between your total wages and your ordinary wages. And ordinary wages refer to your monthly salary, the contribution rate for your ordinary salary, and that is lower than your additional wages. So, um, not to complicate this particular matter, I don't intend to complicate this issue. I just want to be able to share with you that it is supposed to be this transition figure multiplied by 0.25 times your age factor. The formula is theirs. I don't want to get into further details about how to manage this, but I do want to share with you that actually this is already done to some extent how we would address uh, the, the calculations of this transitions offset. So let me now take you to, to the next uh, slide, which is to ask if there are any questions that I can address at this point of time. If not, I have a few questions for you to consider, right? If I may, if I may take this chance to uh, address some immediately. The most obvious question anyone would ask me is, right, how do employees apply for, for um, uh, payouts? You know what? Uh, we don't. We, we don't apply. Employers don't, have, don't need to apply for the payouts because what IRAS will do is they will notify eligible employers regarding the amount payable to them and electronically on that figure disperse the amount. There is a notification, there's a reference and it's updated and you will receive timely notifications uh, whenever you have these notifications done and, and updated. So then why do I need to know this? That's your question to me, right? Must be. Why? Why do I need to bother with this? Because all you need to then be able to do is, okay, how much of it is attributable to the employer? Because the offset benefits the employer. The increase, of course, benefits the employee. Okay, everybody understand that particular concept. Actually, you don't do anything because you will be already notified by us. And this has already happened. Do you remember when? COVID. During the COVID period, I needed to give you a certain, a certain amount and uh, I accounted for this as wage credits because at certain people were disadvantaged and therefore the government provided. This has already been done. This is not new to HR practitioners. Even the newest of people who uh, started as the HR practitioners and the, and, the, and the payroll will understand, hey, how come there's this extra money? Of course, there's a credit. Now, how do you know whether the credit is correct? Okay, honestly, you would not imagine that IRAS will make a mistake, okay? But let me tell you, 
I have seen circumstances in which they have made mistakes um, where the calculation was uh, incorrect in terms of the additional wages or the total wages or the ordinary wages and that calculation was because the documentation presented by employers or rather the HR team was not very accurate and that was because of an error and that's why the figures would have been different so good for you to check and test more importantly ladies and gentlemen as a lawyer I must tell you you must ensure that you have to inform your employees and, the, and your staff to check their itemized billing to ensure that what they have received is correct and what they have in, what what they have um, uh, accepted is correct because if there is a dispute later they're going to tell you they're not going to pay back let me give you one very quick example a very nice example here um i can't tell you the story i can't tell you the the, the, the who the entity was but there was this particular person who was actually working for full time and then she changed the program to a part time okay when she changed the program to a part time some of the salary adjusted now her understanding was the salary would not be adjusted it's just that her hours would be adjusted and she'll pay back but the employer and there were unions behind it said no 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 in fact when we do adjust it we automatically reduce now what was the problem here while her number of hours reduced her salary continued to be the same so what they did was they paid the company paid um, uh, this particular employee in full all her salary every month uh, to, to, to that extent because she was doing overtime and she was working as well um, in the day and therefore and she was here most of the time and therefore no issue about it so one day there's a letter from HR saying uh, sorry we made a mistake guess what's the mistake guys you know what the mistake was overpayment why overpayment supposed to be tabulated on a part-time basis but ended up paying full time how what do we do any thoughts no okay let me tell you immediately union step in immediately employer step in to say we need to recover the money unfortunately not a small amount of money because if I overpaid you by almost two or three thousand dollars what happens there two or three thousand dollars times eight months or nine months or ten months is a lump sum amount of money that I have to pay you plus whatever benefits that you would have been obtaining which you didn't obtain so what's my point over here simple that at the end of the day you do need to ensure that what you have an agreement with the employee whether it's part-time full-time it's confirmed because if not you'll have to do the dirty job of either having the employee sue you to say you have not paid or you've not received their monies or we have to go and recover the money from the employee and in this case unfortunately um, the employer actually had the right to go and recover but big organization so guess what they did big organizations are always very nice to some extent they allowed the payment to be made in installments and what they did was they actually uh, asked to reduce the payment okay now that's not because that was their original position their original position was no no we want to we want to claim all the way i was actually acting for the the, the employee and we had to uh, negotiate 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 our way out of this to say you already paid us because that's what we understood was the meaning right point is ultimately we need to make sure that all of this is communicated to our employees fairly quickly and efficiently right now coming to payments which is the point here i if you ask me when employees will receive the payout the answer is of course for wages paid from january to june employees will receive the payment payout in September, three months after in the same year. And for those that are paid in July to December, you would receive the following year, right? In March, um, three months after. You've already seen this in, in COVID, right? Um, anyone who has been working during the COVID period received any wage credits would have received uh, uh, the amounts uh, uh, progressively. Of course, COVID is governed by the COVID Act and that one had certain uh, requirements of when the payments will be made by the government overall issue is there is a payout right one more question to address ladies and gentlemen when will employers receive the payouts is 
is followed by how right no 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 ma no magic in this answer of course through gyro to pay now corporates but to whom which company which organization gets this it's not to the employees directly it will be credited of course to the employers so again hr professionals uh practitioners and payroll pr processors guys you need to make sure that when you do receive such amounts you are able to determine who is it from and what is the amount form and for which employee because that will be uh something that you need to take into account uh for accounting purposes anyway so so this is just uh recorded for that uh, need okay um just one note over here i think it's important and that is that is to tell you that if employers who are not uh, already on these direct credit modes they have to sign up for gyro or pay now corporate to receive their payouts i imagine i imagine the way that singapore is going almost everybody is on gyro and if you're not then please ensure that you are um i think the process is also very straightforward nowadays but i only speak out of experience of managing our own firm and managing our own payouts okay Okay. Before, thank you for that, Mr. Anu. Before we proceed to the next question, there's one um, question from our participants from Lucy, um, and this is regarding the CPF contribution rate for older employees. Because in the table that we shared, it was um, starting from first January 2024. So, how about September 2023? Is there any change of their contribution in September? A uh, good question. If I can address this answer. the the contribution only affects from 1st of january 2024 so from september onwards there's no change right my understanding is that you will see the increase in employer cpf contribution only starts off from 1st january 2024 and there's a reason for it i think it's because it's to follow the financial years of the companies if not there will be a an overpayment uh, or rather an adjustment that will be quite cumbersome for quite a few organizations right yeah so, okay yes. yeah thank you for that then i think uh, yeah back to you okay so this this is of course for the employer uh, how do i get tax on the payout okay it's a little technical but i think it's uh, answer just for purposes of completeness what happens is that the payout will be taxable in the year of receipt that means if you receive the money in that particular year fy for example 2023 will be fy 2024 right that means uh for the year 2024 is actually for the year before that and what happens is that the wage will be able to support employment of senior workers and of course persons with disability the payout is considered revenue therefore it is connected to the business uh and to defray operating cost in simple english i think if i can say this correctly it will be used to go and cut down your expenses and therefore you will be taxed at the end of the day with the profit of the company or the the fact that there isn't any profit because you're able to lower the rate so that's how it works um individuals they are not required to declare the scheme payouts because what happens is this is actually automatically included in iras Uh, this is the beauty about iras if you fill up your iras tax forms you realize uh, they made this form very very simple nowadays so this figure uh, of which individuals receiving this amount of money for your cto will go directly into your account so really you don't have a lot to do uh, and your accountants will probably know what would be required okay because um other than declaring which is what companies have to do there isn't really much to do in income for income tax form okay so um okay so the assumption in this question i, I know that maybe you guys have questions and you all are processing this early in the morning uh, but the thought process here is probably this um i want to able to share with you that uh, ultimately the scheme has already been included into your system as soon as iras recognizes that there is a wage increase 
or there is a CPF contribution increment, there is going to be a transition wage requirement. And the only thing that you then have to take note of is why. Because if you can't explain why the funds have come in, it's okay if there are only two people working for me. What if you have 20 people, 200 people working for me? Then it becomes very difficult. You don't know why you're doing certain things. You don't know why you've received. So that's why as HR professionals, please ensure that you are aware of this uh, element that's necessary for us. So to answer this question, can employers appeal to qualify for the CTO scheme? If that assumes that they didn't qualify in the first place, I just have to tell you this requirement which is A, employers have up to two months uh, for the payout to lodge an appeal. Do you know why this is there? Remember I started off by telling you sometimes IRAs can get it wrong. So please check that you have received uh, the correct amount and for what purpose and what amount and for which period of time because if not we have a problem, right? The problem is having to go into appeal. And it's not that there are too many cases of appeal. I, Lynn, I understand that, or rather last I understand is that there are not many appeals because, um, because the process hasn't really started per se. But an appeal process is available if you realize that someone is not in there, okay? So, okay. Appeal process arises because the government thinks there's abuse, okay? Uh, I know I'm getting a little too deeply into the process, right? And without doubt, right? Without doubt, I think it's very important to appreciate. It's it's very important to appreciate this uh, fact. The fact is that um, People use schemes, whether it was the PIC scheme or any of the wage credit schemes to try and find ways to draw money out. It is a very serious offence, ladies and gentlemen, that your organisation that has been or that you're working for is aware that these schemes are there to help people. The moment the C scheme is compromised, everyone suffers because the government loses its trust in the system or, or it loses its trust in its policy and therefore it stops or changes it again and then we, we we don't get the benefit of it so it's very important right as hr personnel i'm going to just say this out you can be whistleblowers because if something is not being done correctly by employers you have a right to go and explain to say hey this was not done this was actually but i say no more we're all professionals we are all business owners, we all have interests for us in our, in our mind. At the end of the day, the CPF scheme is what? It is to take care of an older worker, it is to take care of people, uh, to join the force, to increase their numbers, it is to assist us with ensuring that more is saved in the future, right? So in that, my summary, in that three minutes that I can uh, uh, complete this, or rather in the next one minute that I can complete this, will be this, right? First, what was the scheme for? Scheme was obviously to ensure that you can save more in your rainy day in the future. Good and bad points, I have my mixed views about it, but it is what it is. Two, I need to bring more people into the force. So my CPF changes are tweaked so that more will join in when I need them to join in the force as we age as a population. Okay, three, as you will see when we talk a bit more of how we're helping other groups of people as well to try and come into the force. So what's important at the moment with CPF schemes are from a very practical level as HR practitioners to understand, okay, I now need to know after I leave this one session that September 2023, I have an increase. 1st of June, January 2024, I need to be careful of looking at my CPF numbers and moving forward, I need to ask myself whether I have an older generation of worker in my force and how do I deal with that. These three points are effectively from what we've covered despite all the calculations and everything else. And on that note, um, I can conclude section one and if you have questions, I'm open to address any of them, any of them now. So we'll continue with um, our second session. I hope everybody had a great session from uh, 
for our first uh, session today with um, the changes in the CPF contributions and that uh, you understand what are the main changes and also what are the um, the CTO for the um, changes are uh, in the upcoming changes. So with that, um, we'll proceed with our next session, okay, which will be on the topic of uh, support measures from employee. And over to you, Mr. Anil. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the lovely summary that, uh, that you put forth, Ivan. Right, everyone. So a uh, short break. I know it's a short break, but we, we can get through this fairly easily and quickly. Support measures for the employees. Who does it affect? Right? And offhand straight away, support measures always means that somebody needs help. Who are the people that need help? Five categories of people. Low wage worker. And that's a whole debate about what a low wage worker is, but I'll, I'll come to talk about it a bit more. Um, two seniors, we spoke about it earlier. Three persons with disabilities, four ex offenders, five platform workers. Five categories that may not be your typical person in the office. So that's the truth of the matter. But let's ask ourselves why this is important. Okay? So my old story, remember An, right? So An, in 1955, he was working, he was all well, he was okay. Uh, he started working, his CPF was going up and down. He went through the financial crisis. He went through recession in 1986. He went through uh, changing Singapore. He went through a change in leadership. He went through a lot of things, right? But what is the one thing that, that mattered to him most for, for, for everything else? It was because continuously the government was improving and uh, providing a benefit for him, right? For example, uh, as he got older, senior workers, as he reached retirement, retirement started shifting and he realized he had to work longer and longer, but he also realized that he could get employment. Um, there was also the senior employment credit that started uh, in 2020. And then of course, what's new or rather an extension of time is the part-time re-employment grant. Let me just very quickly tell you these three or four things that are important uh, for our purpose. Why is support measure necessary, right? Why support measure is necessary is explained earlier. Not only do we have an aging population, it also needs an active workforce. Why? because it would tax the government's resources if too many people were ill. Healthcare would be at another level altogether. This happens in more developed countries. Like for example, I can give you first-hand experience of UK where a lot more people are on the, on the dole or the system where they work, they, they get paid on a monthly basis and, and they're just ill. So what is your incentive? Just be sick. Huh? Just continue being sick. But some other countries don't allow this. Some more modern countries in Europe, for example, don't allow this. They have very strict rules about it, uh, about uh, taxing the system. So, so it, it is obviously to ensure that you don't have a lot of money being spent on healthcare to look after the people rather than them being productive. So that's really the, the real reason. So. Information you probably already know. So I just want to share this portion when I say that, uh, and I'll explain that a bit later when I talk about the senior employment credit uh, that will be extended to 2025 and the part-time re-employment grant that we extended. All of these things are just basically for knowledge, but hey, this news is not new by Nearly one in five citizens is 65 years and, old, and older. And what has happened is this super age, super aging that's going on. Previously, we had a, a figure, a comparative figure. What I say was uh, uh, a proportion of 65 was increasing to 18.4% in 2022 as opposed to 11.1. 
and by 2030 this will increase to 23.8 so what's happening here if you just plot the graph x versus y you will see this exponential growth of, of of people becoming older you know you would imagine right the first thing that anyone should do is just saying let's find ways to bring singaporeans let's find ways to bring more people into singapore but that has got its own problems why you have too many people coming in and you realize the fabric of singapore changes so we really have to start working with what we have and this is a interesting point because i want to share this um, there is this link or rather this bond that singapore is talking about which is to be more family friendly supportive uh, to have a better ecosystem between employers and its staff especially for the older workers i cannot stress this particular point it is a mindset change of the current employers and also the other thing is employers employing singaporeans and prs as opposed to just foreigners that's another topic altogether but we'll discuss let me just show you the numbers in charts it's so easily readable that our numbers and our percentages of the people of a certain age group it's only increasing as we go by i can only imagine that this particular 23.8 percent will increase as we go on another 10 years into the future right so what is the what is this thing about the senior employment credit scheme of course it's to encourage people to hire older workers another scheme another amount to give you what happens here is that um, you will get an offset of up to eight percent of the employee's monthly wages age 55 and above earning four thousand up to four thousand per month so this wage offset is for up to three years <clears throat> the scheme per se is not a difficult scheme it's just basically to give uh, employers a wage offset of 8% of the employees monthly wages so to be eligible this is the next thing you need to take into a condition who are we talking about registered and operating in Singapore employers who are registered and employing in Singapore see let me say that again employers who are registered and operating in Singapore and contributing another same fine line CPF contributions for all their employees right hiring Singapore citizens and PRs who are 55 years and above. okay quite clear um, I, I spoke about this in the earlier session and I continue to speak about it in this particular section and I think I'm trying to bring the message across to you the HR practitioners take note that there's going to be a flood of foreign workers foreign not foreign of senior workers coming into your workforce because the system is meant to go and push more people to start working or if they're not working to come into your system that's the truth okay so um needless to say there is also another provision to this and that is they've also increased discrimination practices and the changes that they've made in the law right so you will see that the employment tribunal one of the few changes that they made to the employment tribunal is to hear not only wage issues but also hear any wrongful dismissal and wrongful dismissal will arise from any form of discrimination that occurs if i wrongfully send the person out because of his age or, or because of his race or because of the fact that of his disposition any of these things will then raise the issues of whether the person has been found properly um, and should not have been asked to go and to have continued his work why is this relevant it's relevant because when you start looking at a system and i want to ensure that senior workers are in the system i need to protect them how do i protect them i need to make sure that there are laws that ensure that there's no discrimination age discrimination for example now just think about it right uh if i had a 20 year old or a 25 year old a 35 year old or 45 year old and someone who is above 55 year old four categories of people right mr ang is probably now in my last category 55 and above your natural condition your natural tendency would not be to consider the 55 year old because as employers or rather hr practitioners you ask yourself hey, this person can work or not why because you reflected against your parents right you ask yourself oh my my parents are no they are not moving at the, at the right they're sick they're not well they're not going to be a good fit this is exactly what the government is trying to avoid because firstly we've changed the way we are trying to live right 
reduce sugar, reduce salt. You have probably seen these ads in the papers uh, and seen the ads in the news in the in the in, on TV at least. Um, and, and what's the purpose over here? Is to ensure that we have an active workforce. Okay, I don't need to go and say more. I think you all understand the essence of this. The essence of this is the mindset of our employers must change with regard to employ, uh, employability of seniors. Hence, senior employment credit. Why only for three years? It may be extended, I don't know. But as far as I'm concerned, someone up to the uh, amount of $4,000 uh, will have an offset, a wage offset of up to 8%. Not bad, not bad. Money to come to in consideration. Um, ultimately, it is going to be a financial decision. If they can add value, why not, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, my slide prompts to see whether there are any questions, but okay. But maybe I can address. Anyone has any questions? In no, nope, we are good so far. Okay, good, excellent. So let's take this. Um, again, how do employers apply for this? The best part is employers do not need to apply for payouts. IRAs will notify eligible employers regarding the amount uh, payable to them electronically based on the notification. So that's really the, 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 the response. This is the answer. Basically, it's already automated. So why do I need to know? You need to know because there is an incentive for bosses, for business owners to know that if you hire employers, employees, senior employees, there is a wage credit benefit for you. And I'm basically getting the ministry to tell you, please do, please use this benefit for the next three years at least. Is money coming in your direction? Why not? Right? Um, there will be some challenges, fair, right? There are challenges because uh, some workers may not be able to, some employees may not be able to fit into the system. But hey, there is a fund for you to be able to push, try it. Okay, let's just see the numbers. Um, I okay. So, as an example of this, of what they are trying to show this table, I think you can see the table itself. I don't need to explain more than that. Um, if you're aged between, for example, sixty and sixty-four years old, the percentage is up to three thousand uh, dollars, three percent of the wage. So, how they calculate this is that it is uh, uh, on this particular formula. I will just take note of a couple of things. It is between the ages of 60 to 64, 65 to 67, and 68 onwards. You will see that the benefit is higher. I know what you're going to tell me, right? And you're going to tell me this. You're going to say 3% of a wage is nothing. It makes no difference to us. It doesn't incentivize us. I think this is something that the government will consider. It will recite when it starts seeing whether numbers are being picked up. But for now, you just know that there's this particular payout and it will be relevant for our purposes if you know when it comes into effect. Now, um, I don't need to spend too much time on this, uh, on this particular slide because I think you understand the mathematics of it and you can check yourself Right, and this is of course for 2024 and 2025. The percentage drops a little bit more. Again, same question you're going to ask me: How does it benefit me? Why is it going to make so much of a difference? I understand. And then, if I move on to the next, okay. And how do I get taxed on the on the payout? The payouts will be taxable in the year of receipt. It's the same answer with regards to uh, SEC's wage offset to support the employment. So this particular amount is basically taken care of from IRAS's perspective. All you need to know is to just remember that this will be taken care to reduce your balance at the end of the day. This explanation is really just an amount to reduce your expenses so that whatever credit that comes in, revenue that comes in to reduce your expenses at the end of the day will show your net effect. Not important for HR practitioners, but good to know. 
right? Because effectively, this is an accounting model more than anything else. Appeal is um, uh, the same. There's a two months period for appeal. Again, I think there may not be so many particular cases. Okay. Um, let me take you to this particular video. I actually like very much. I don't know whether you can hear it. If you can, guys, please let me know. Um, I think we're having some audio issues, but let's see. Can it be rectified? I think maybe give it about two minutes, see if the video loads. If not, then I don't think so. We'll be able to play the video. Okay, I, I think we can wait for about 30 seconds to a minute just to see how it works because I think it's a really lovely video. Um, Korean drama, you know, now it's very prompt. Now everyone must know. Korean drama has become so hot. Just the other day, this 10-year-old, 12-year-old told me he wants to go for Blackpink. I said, what is that? He said, Blackpink is, uh, is uh, a band. I said, uh, Blackpink doesn't sound like a band. It sounds like a car. And he says, no, Blackpink has got these four girls that are dancing around. So it's like, oh, wow. And they, they sing in Korean and English. I went even more, wow. Because if I, I asked him, are you, do you speak Korean? He says, no, I don't speak any Korean at all. And said, okay, then do you understand? He says, no, I don't understand any Korean at all. And then I asked him, what are you? Oh, I'm Indian. I'm like, okay. Well, is not kept with the employer as long as the conditions are met. And of course, this was not part of the, the discussion in the budget. But um, what was, of course, intended is to protect more senior workers. Let me now uh, come to this particular point about the part-time re-employment grant. Another grant that was introduced in Budget Parliament this year, 2023, was aimed to help workers aged 62 and above who wish to work part-time to remain employed and engaged in the workforce. Another goal at employers, right? Why? Because some employees will come, employees will come and tell you they cannot work full-time. They're tired. They cannot start their day at uh, 7 in the morning and work all the way till 5, 6, 7 o'clock. Very tired. So, there's this grant to allow a certain number of people to work and I'll just go through this eligibility with you. You just need to know because ultimately when you report to IRAS, CPF, uh, automatically this is updated but I'll come to this in a minute. So obviously the employer must be registered operating in Singapore has workers who are Singapore citizen and permanent residents. Ladies and gentlemen, key phrase, this whole talk about Singapore budget seems to be about looking for Singapore citizens and permanent residents, inclusive society. Budget 2023, looking to the future inclusive society, right? Now, you also must ensure that the part-time work arrangement meets certain minimum requirements. What is the minimum requirement? 20 hours a week of work per week and a prorated salary and benefit package. So, um, employers who voluntarily re-employ the workers on a part-time basis for at least one year will be eligible for a grant up to $125,000. I know you're going to tell me again, uh, you don't get $125,000. Yes, I fully agree with you. I don't get. But what they're saying is that the grant is up to $125,000 because it works for certain larger organizations. Okay? So, when, when you talk about um, uh, this particular scheme, the purpose behind it, of course, is to incentivize employers to offer part-time re-employment given right understood flexible work arrangements structured career planning and to have their eligibility criteria improved upon that's basically how they would become better workers for the force but um there are problems with flexible work because when work needs to be done at a certain time it needs to be done when it doesn't need to be done at a certain time then what happens who takes care of that so obviously the grant has got a certain uh, mechanism i'm just going to walk you through the mechanism in this particular manner uh, first when we talk about the grant just give me a second right so 
uh, this this is how it works. It says that uh, the employers uh, will be eligible for funding of up to $125,000 per company where you will get $2,500 per resident senior worker. I don't like this phrase, but generally in short, it's uh, our senior work, our senior employees who have been there. It's capped to 50 senior work employers per company. And there are, of course, two steps determine the number of senior workers and the total number of uh, PTRG, part-time reemployment grant that is entitled for you. For every person who you employ, you get $2,500. You see the message, ladies and gentlemen. The message seems to be hire people who are older so that you can take the Singapore grant. I don't really like this model, per se, personally, my own personal view, because what it does is um, um, it fosters employers to 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 go in to go and look for particular candidates so that I can earn the money rather than finding candidates who can value add to my organization. Um, you know, but of course, I want more people to come into the force. This is their policy. We're just understanding the policy. How does it affect HR professionals, guys? How does it make a difference to you? Does it make a difference to you? You just need to know it's a mindset change to force employers to think about the bigger picture. The bigger picture is there are all these grants. Why don't you hire foreign uh, senior workers, senior employees? Why not? What's your excuse not to do so? Okay. So therefore, actually as a HR practitioner, a HR payroll processing person, as a business owner, you need to remember one very important factor. What is that factor? That important factor is actually to understand that if you have a person who is older, you automatically need to have a checkbox of things that you need to clear. Okay, has the person uh, going to be ob obtaining a certain a different rate of CPF? Check the person is entitled to any grants. Check whether the person is able to, uh, is going to be reaching 63. Check if they have a structured plan. So these are the things that as a HR person, you would start asking yourself, not only for your senior team, but generally for all of the for all of your employees, because uh, the strategies would affect different people. And I'll come to this in a, uh, in a minute. Right? Firms employing persons with disabilities. My personal view, this is only mine alone, my personal view. Um, maybe I become a bit too sympathetic when I have a person with disability because I, I apply the wrong, I, I apply the wrong wisers. I apply the wrong mentality. I think that, oh, I should be sympathetic to the person. Oh, I should be able to, um, you know, look after the particular, because the person has got a certain disability. And and that could be a, a, a problem. This is my own personal view. You have your own. Uh, some people do really well. I, I know quite a few organizations actually uh, employ uh, persons with disabilities um, uh, very, very successfully. And and who actually these people take on managerial, managerial roles. But there are not so many because there are, of course, um, you know, circumstances of making sure the person is safe. Your environment is safe, that you have ramps that can take up the person. I once um, had a particular client complain to me that uh, in this particular road along higher labor, um, there was a building. And what happened was, it was actually used for the lorries to move their stuff. And this particular person who had a wheelchair was not able to move in that particular location because the the the, the ramps were too big and too difficult to move up. It was like as though you're going for a for an exercise up uphill because the ramps are of a certain inclination. So uh, buildings actually do have requirements to have certain places where it's it's disability accessible. Uh, like disability toilets and disability ramps and basically handles to allow persons. But not all of them are taken care of because they are like discarded to some extent. So if your organization is fairly large and you have an uh, organization which has got requirements for people to be able to, to climb or take on a particular stair or a particular lift or in a circumstance go to a particular toilet, you need to ensure that this is available in your premises and that they are available for these persons. The other thing is of course abuse because somebody else goes and takes a particular toilet and the disabled person is unable to do so. So, so with, 
with that in mind, with that in mind, um, there is of course the grant, the Enabling Employment Credibility Grant. Just so I can explain this to you, the EEC versus the other grant, the SEC, they they, they can't be used together. They are just basically to uh, they're not stackable. That's what that's what it means. It's if you apply for one, you can't apply for the other. But um, you don't typically tend to have too many uh, uh, disability uh, persons, but you tend to have a little more senior citizens, if I can say that correctly. So, just to read off this, the um, the enabling employment credit is actually to provide offsets to employers or persons with disabilities, PWDs. I don't like the description, but hey. I'm just going to use it for simplicity. From April 2023 to December, those who those who do hire them will um, will receive greater support for hiring, and who have not been working for at least six months. Again, right? The motive is to bring more people into the force. Um, the whole idea is just to provide a certain support. I'll show you the next table, which has got this setup. Give me a second. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, if I can just take you to who's eligible and how much support for employers. Um, it's interesting to note the age group here. Higher Singapore citizens or permanent uh, residents with persons with disabilities age. 13 and above right ladies and gentlemen and earning below four thousand dollars so um it's quite interesting because typically you don't have 13 and above as an age group for our our category of people mostly people have to be um able to enter into a contract at the age of 18 or even 17 but generally 13 and above we are quite careful because they're children or young young minds and uh, uh, th again, the main point is, of course, you make timely mandatory contributions. So here, it's just to include this group of people who cannot work, and you want to introduce them to come to work for you. They will give you a certain amount. If I can just read off how much support can be given, those who earn under four thousand dollars and not working for at least six months will get this grant. The grant will be um, uh, twenty percent of that, so it works out to about four hundred dollars. That's roughly. Uh, how it is because it's 20 percent of the wage or or capped at 400 dollars the numbers the figures are there i i would just be reiterating what the numbers are but my point is that again there's another amount for grant figures how would this be relevant if you look at the figures for the for the uh, overall impact it would reduce your balance by this because the government will pay you this amount at the end of the day right the example is there uh pw earning PWD earning 2000 not work for six months before being hired. Then maximum support provided by employee in the year is 400 times 12, which is the maximum support. And the permanent wage offset is $4,800. The additional time limited offset is $3,600. This is the formula that they work. This is a figure that they would have worked and given to you. This number you would remember. I wouldn't remember the numbers honestly, because um, you know, the computation for each worker to go and work out becomes challenging, but at least you know how it works, what would be the mechanism, right? Um, let me take you to this particular table just for a summary. There's a, a, a percentage of that particular number, and that's that's what you would you you would have at the end of the day. So there are two components: there's a permanent wage pay component, and there's an additional payout for someone who's not been working up for six to nine months. Okay, um, I. I don't need to spend too much time again here because as long as somebody says that he's got a disability and you've applied to make the person that the person has got a disability, you're enabling your employment uh, employment credit, you're enabling employment credit, okay? A lot to see as to in the future as to what the numbers will do in terms of change. Maybe one year from now, um, DPM or maybe PM Lawrence Wong would have already explained to us that the numbers have been very encouraging and uh, they may want to tweak the, the plan but hey this is a work in progress we don't know okay anyone with um, any questions on this particular i think it's fairly fairly straightforward 
No, I think um, so far we are good to go. Just give me one moment. Um, all right. So. Let's just take some questions. Uh, if you've not asked the questions, I, I will set out these questions for you all to get thinking. So the question is basically, um, how do employers apply for payouts? You know the answer to that question already. We've gone through it. Basically, employers don't need to apply. They automatically will be notified by eligible employers regarding the amount payable. That's the best thing about it. When is the payout received? Again, the payment is going to be January to June and then three months after, no issue. And then now I let me take a question on with regard to the if you have hired a new local PWD, how will I know if my new local hire will qualify for EEC as a PWD? This is a question I saved for and the answer to this question is no guess about it. IRAS will automatically assess your eligibility for EEC including enhanced support for PWDs best part about it. You know why? Because I think the government knows, right, that if you leave it to employers to go and find the figures and to HR officers, well, we'll scratch our head crazy because we'll have no clue when we apply, what do we do, and we're already very busy. So, you understand the impact behind this? It is a way that, and it also does another thing for you, it allows IRAS very cleverly to be able to adjust the program because in case they say they want to increase or reduce or whatever it is, it's in their control to be able to do so. It just means, of course, IRAS is very busy lah, because they have to know eligibility. But I think nowadays, with technology, it's fairly straightforward to identify who works where. All right. Um, the PWD must be supported by SG and able to qualify. I think that is a scheme in which the person is covered by disability or registered with disability. And disabilities cover things like Autism, intellectual disability, physical disability, deafness, visual impairment, uh, usual. And of course, if you want to consider disabilities, uh, you want to find out whether the person is disabled or not, you could directly go and check this. It's at the bottom. I've just included this data. It's uh, sgenable.sg. It's to consider uh, whether the person falls under the disabilities category. That's really what it is, lah, okay? Uh, so again, right, you're going to ask me, what? Well, that means I don't have to think about it. Yes, HR guys and ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to think about it, but you do need to know what is available to you because there will be a figure that says some grant and credit that came for EEC, SEC, or whether it is the part-time grant or whether it's a senior citizen grant, whatever it is. Uh, you need to know why it's there. Short, short answer, okay? Right? This uh, appealing, I think, for this purpose and for moving forward, I think it's not as important um, because ultimately we have to make the error, but I don't need to spend too much time. Okay? Uh, again, how do I, you know, do I get text on the payout? Um, it's, as explained earlier, it's exactly the same response to this. If IRAS handles how I... Uh, support measures to employ ex-offenders. And then we can kick on uh, the next uh, the next portion per se. So if I could just do this issue about employing ex-offenders. Let me tell you another story uh, about ex-offenders that really, really caught my attention. So, has anyone heard about the Yellow Ribbon Project? The Yellow Ribbon Project. Has anyone heard about the Yellow? Yes? Uh, I can't see you guys, but I imagine that your answer is probably nodding your head. Then, hey, I'm with you. The Yellow Ribbon Project was actually a project created to employ ex-offenders. Right? Okay. Let me give you some facts, right, that you probably may not know about the Yellow Ribbon Project. So, um, I first discovered the Yellow Ribbon Project, right, when I was going to the state courts along Havelock Road. And opposite that Havelock Road, if uh, the old state courts, there was actually a shop selling dim sum and pao. 
okay um and uh, and other uh, other things as well uh, because uh, they, it was almost like a, it was almost like a semi fast food kind of food which could cater to a variety of people and you know it's very fast moving and i noticed something in that particular place some of them had their bracelets on their legs and um, and other people had uh, uh, big tattoos all over their place and uh, many of them looked like they were very focused in their particular work so i i i then learned that this particular place this shop was actually set up to in, in, to employ to employ um uh ex offenders who have committed and who have been put on release so this scheme is not new it is obviously to ensure that the ex offenders or uh, these people who have reformed are able to come back into the system and serve society and to make a difference to society and that really was the benefit of making sure that at the end of the day we had a more inclusive society coming into the force okay now let me tell you a bit more about the yellow project i didn't realize that in fact there's a lot of the reform uh, reformation going on in prison itself so what happens is that um all your laundry that happens uh, the big laundries the white cloths that go to various parties and functions uh, are actually washed uh, in prison they have this huge uh washing machine and dryers huge to stack up two three levels and there's a team of people at the back that they get all this washing done you think that was the only exciting thing you know what even the food even the food of certain breads uh that were made were actually made in prison now this whole idea is to ensure that people are able to come out into the force and of course in the emphasis at the moment is to ensure that you don't reoffend because when reoffending means that there's a cost to the society and organization so one of the few things that they do is they introduce people from the yellow ribbon project or people who have just come out of prison or about to come out from prison to try and assimilate to try and connect back with society i know what you're thinking ladies and gentlemen i have the same thoughts okay i give you an example i think i think it's uh, media 5 uh media 5 has got this program about uh, uh about prison breaking from prison or something like that and i looked at the characteristic of one particular candidate right and this particular candidate was actually someone who had repeatedly abused uh his wife and therefore there was a charge for for harassment and he gone to prison six times already so i'm asking myself yellow ribbon project is to try and ensure the person can come into the force if i have someone like this and if i found out about his history i would be very nervous you know for example i come to my office and him and me and i told him go and fill up your your work you're not doing a good he gets angry and he smashes my i don't know table face whatever it is ah, that's going to scare me because um that's really what we would i would be terrified about right so um the encouragement is to include a table a, a force that can come into the system and take care of uh, a, a, a a vacuum in the uh, in the organization right at the same time i think it's also very important or how we would be able to to identify these persons and their interest to reform because ultimately what we want to do is give them help help to be able to continue with their life because without money what would they do go back to crime we don't want that right but i understand hr i understand fully i'm nervous uh, it's my own prejudice maybe but hey um what does it do for us maybe money can help us and that's when we talk about the um uplifting employment credit scheme now what happens here in the employment update scheme is if i can just take you it is basically a form of a time limited wage offset to encourage firms to employ offenders uh 
uh, in 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 their in their circumstance. So let me just uh, say this correctly. Give me one moment to collect. Yes. So this scheme is actually a form of a time limited wage offset. Again, it's another offset, right? To encourage companies to employ ex offenders uh, who have been introduced into the force, into the workforce. So. What the credit scheme does is that um, those who earn less than four thousand dollars and released within three years prior to employment. So there is a criteria, right? What is the criteria? Earn less than four thousand dollars and uh, within three years prior to employment have been released from prison without uh, within three years prior to employment. Now, what happens is that uh, the wage offset of twenty percent. Um, is kept at the sum of six hundred dollars. The whole idea is, I don't have to say this very clearly. If you're an ex-offender and I can not pay for this personally, you can come and work for me. I'm not saying everyone is bad. Sometimes you've had a, you 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 do have some run with the law and you made mistakes and you realize that there's a better way to move forward. We all should give everybody an opportunity, uh, although it's very difficult, and we try our best. But ultimately. What we're trying to do is, it's applicable to ex offenders hired from straight away April 2023 to December 2025. Whether the scheme will increase or not, I don't know the answer to this question. But this scheme is available. How relevant is it to HR person? You need to know because tomorrow when you have a person in your form. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is something maybe nobody tells you, but do you have in your inquiry to your form when you have an interview? Uh, with a with a, a potential employee, do you have questions that ask them specifically about their previous conviction? Then the question I have for you is: Would that be considered discriminatory? Actually, no. Under the law, they are supposed to disclose to you uh, that they have a certain prior convi- conviction. Uh, if they don't disclose to you, you have grounds to go and terminate them because effectively they didn't share information. But again, that's another topic altogether. It's a topic about how to deal with and interviews and uh, and uh, the prejudice nature and the questions that you can ask and interview questions. But my point is, an ex offender must be able to come and tell you, or you should be able to have a question in your interview question that says in your interview questionnaire that says um, any previous convictions, any issues with regard to bankruptcy, because all of this would have an impact on the person's status in Singapore. Yeah. I think y'all are saying yes, but I imagine um, that um, that y'all are listening to to this aspect of it so that y'all understand what what it's got uh, an impact for. Okay, so who qualifies for who qualifies employers who hire ex offenders earning a monthly wage of an amount below four thousand dollars. Make timely mandatory CPF contributions. Again, you see the main key point is you must be continuously making CPF contributions for the employee. <clears throat> uh, wages paid to business owners or employers trading in their own personal capacity will not be eligible for UAE. So, um, someone who is a sole proprietor, someone who is a partner in the company. A person who is uh, trading under his own personal capacity, uh, for example, hawkers, they unfortunately will not be covered under the scheme. This is obviously for people who get into the business. Okay, and um, now all of them, uh, even if they have made their own CPF contributions, ultimately the point is, you must remember. The idea is to go and cater for a business, not for a person who's gone to start off on his own, which I found really strange because the person who usually comes out, most businesses will say, "I don't want to hire you for various reasons," and they won't tell you why. But never mind. Having said all of that, I think the truth of the matter is there is a scheme that will help an ex-employer, and that's where I, an ex-offender, and that's where I think where we are. Okay, um, no salary per se. Because you work, you get paid. I understand the model. It is a very attractive model for organisations that don't want to hire employees. But think about it: is it fair? Is it really fair? 
because these workers are the ones at the end of the day no cpf contribution uh, cpf again no uh, uh, protection in terms of an employee because are they employees or are they contract for services are they employees so the line is very grey over there. The government decided that the like, grey line cannot stick on. But you notice it only did so for the platform workers. Why? Very interesting. So firstly, of course, is to ensure that they receive adequate financial protection in case of work injury. What is the one injury that everybody suffers most of the time? Riding. They're always exposed to the, uh, the elements of the roads and all of these other circumstances, right? So, the idea behind the financial protection is to ensure that they were compensated, compensated for loss, okay? The second is the mandatory CPF contributions by platform companies to those under 30, but an opt-in for older workers. If you look at this scheme, right, this is not available to any other group of people. There is no opt-in for me or mandatory for people under 30, but above 30, I can opt-in. No such chance, right? But still, this is a compromise. So, I shared this particular portion in which um, all platform companies will be required to provide the same level of work injury compensation as employees which are entitled under WECA. Okay, I'll share a little secret with you uh, of why this figure $4,000 comes about. Some of you already know the answer but I'll talk about it in a short while when we when we discuss in better details. So, um, platform workers were only covered for death and permanent disability up to ten dollars to $30,000 depending on their amount. Uh, whereas under WECA, Right, work injury compensation claims. I've done quite a few of those in which uh, people have suffered, and the claim is now up to two hundred eighty-nine thousand dollars. Now, can you imagine if you suffered a death or you suffered a permanent injury and you only get thirty thousand dollars riding a bike? How are you going to feed your family? No chance. So I think it was correct to align WICA work injury compensation uh, under the scheme. So every employee. Um, will every person, every every platform worker will have to be covered under the employee scheme as well? Okay. So, what happens here? It's um, platform companies to purchase work injury compensation insurance. Guys, I'm sure you have done this. You know what is required. You need to talk to your insurance agents to be able to provide the necessary workers here include whether you want to uh, also involve platform workers please remember platform workers are now part of the system therefore you need to consider them in the equation platform workers are entitled to the same scope and the level of work injury as well as um, any kind of uh, companies who are thinking of platform workers will apply the same model insurers tripartite uh, platform companies to be able to ensure that their workers are protected okay now the whole idea behind it is of course representation right i want to enhance representation of platform workers i want to ensure that they have formal rights i also want to ensure that they are formally represented and that's why the various groups that are in current discussions with platform i think that this space is going to move there are going to be a lot more people i only ask this one question right as hr persons would i have a platform workers agreement because currently i have a full-time agreement and i know what are my terms and conditions over there um, i know that there is um, um, a part-time agreement because i know the number of hours i need to include there my numbers will change but is there a platform agreement that I should be preparing soon for all my HR passes? Maybe because, look, if I need to think about protecting his opt-in up until the age of 30, but opt-out, then is he an employee or do I still continue a contract for service? Most of you, right, HR professionals uh, will tell me, hey, um, Stanil, come on, I know the answer to this one. We obviously keep them as independent contractors. True. But now just remember that the CPF 
contribution would have to be mandatory for less than 30. Uh, and that's the point that I'm going to make now. And those who opt out will have to think about how that works. Um, because then they are just the normal independent contractors, right? So what, what I would then do is to share with you this point that the significant level of management control over platform workers should provide CPF contributions at the same rates as employers. So this would be, of course, for those who are under 30, because that is confirmed. Um, and then those who are above 30, the rule is uh, what we've already discussed. Now, can I just then explain to you, and you probably will tell me, oh no, oh no, this means that there's additional cost again for my contract for service. Of course, this is another element. Guess what? Another scheme in its way to offset this particular cost the budget provides pwcpf transition support in parliament dpm lawrence wong spoke about it for a very short period of time because his understanding was that employees would definitely confirm complain that their cost is going to come down do you remember when we spoke about it in the beginning when I have an employment portion, my amount is going to come down naturally, right? Because effectively, I now have to take out a certain of my cash portion and put it into CPF. Huh. When I used to be collecting cash all the way, or I used to get all of my cash, I now have to reduce it. Of course, the reasons are, you know, to protect the family and etc. Uh, all explained earlier. So, if you look at the Mandatory CPF contributions by platform owners and the impact they would have. The whole plan of this PWCPF transition support is to try and defray some of these costs. I think it is to try and defray complaints. So they had to put in this figure, offset part of the PW share of the year on year increase in CPF uh, OSA contribution rates. Right? I haven't gone there yet, Marilyn, but it's okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, the Singapore PW earning $2,500 or less per month uh, will be eligible if they are required to or opt in to make contribution based on aligned CPF contribution rates. So, uh, this slide on my right, or the, this section on my right, it says platform workers who earn $500 or less a month do not to need to make CPF contribution is because ultimately if you do that they'll take no money back home maybe 400 so those who earn above 500 but below 750 will contribute at least a reduced rate so platform companies do not need to contribute CPF to platform workers who earn $50 or less right so ladies and gentlemen if I ask you this particular question quite honestly do you think that platform workers are working only for $2,500 or less or $500 or less by any chance? I think your answer maybe to me may be varying, right? Because um, it really depends on the number of hours you contribute. Most people can choose to work less hours, but I think if this is your job, you tend to be working longer hours and earning more than $2,500 to some extent. So. I'm not sure how this scheme is going to work out. It's a purely brand new scheme. It's a scheme that is there. Please remember how it works. So just take note um, uh, that it exists. This PCTS, we've got all these abbreviations, Singapore's favorite pastime. And um, let me now take you to this next slide of how it works. Quite honestly, um, I think it is meant to uh, attract the platform workers to be there. Uh, my Mr. Favorite, Mr. Ang is there, uh, but this Mr. Ang is 30 years old in 2024. So let's just look at the example, right? Um, $2,000 earned after expenses per month. On average, Mr. Ang owes 
own CPF contribution will increase by $50 per month each year if he opts in for the aligned CPF contribution rates. And this will go to his OA and SA, including both his and his platform company's contribution. Mr. Ang will save an additional $120 per month in his CPF account. This is how the fund is supposed to work. Uh, Mr. Ang's salary at the bottom, you can look at this, uh, is written uh, below what his monthly contribution would be and how the additional OA contributions will come in. So this honestly is, is just an example of, of um, the uh, contribution on a face-by-face -face basis. Ultimately, what the government is saying is that from 2024, uh, the offset is 75%. 2025 to 2026 is 50%, and 2027 onwards is 25%. Um, why? Because I want to encourage more people to put in their money. I don't know how it's going to work. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know what to what extent this scheme is even going to work on for a long basis because companies can decide to go and do these contributions directly themselves and have more control. Who knows? But what it means is you probably already see this in your grab and your gojects. How many of you have already seen that the platform fees, platform fees in your gojek and in your grab has increased from 70 cents or from 30 cents to 70 cents depending on the provider? Obvious. Why? More cost to the company, no longer one in which the company would have to be worried about. It's more cost to the company, therefore it has to be worried about all of the extra costs it has to pay the platform workers. No platform workers or no uh, 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 drivers or no people who are working as independent contractors means that we have an economy that is crippling. We definitely need everyone of this nature, but we need to protect them. Fact. Yeah? So, um, it is a very crowded uh, uh, slide, but I think the gist of it, you understand, there is this particular scheme and how it would work. HR, you need to remember what worker is he? Is he my employee or is he my contractor for service? And if it's so, what age is he? That will give you clarity. Okay? Okay, I am now going to move on to the next support measure. And this support measure is, of course, already in place. From 2017 onwards, there was already uh, there was already a, a scheme for paternity, a paternity leave and, and unpaid infant care leave. Um, so I, I hope to be able to take you through this video now. Uh, Marilyn, do we wait for it to? So for fathers in the equation, in this, uh, I'll tell you my own personal experience while the video is probably loading to some extent. My personal experience was I never got a chance to talk about paternity leave with any of my bosses. No way. Um, I remember that I was in practice and I continued to be, at that time I was reporting to my, my boss and what my boss told me was, what paternity leave? Huh? You want paternity leave? Apply leave up. Then like, I went like, but it's uh, mandated. He says, not my problem. Uh, you go and find a way. And just at that time, my my daughter was born. And so I was like, oh, now I got chance to go off. He says, no chance. So I understand that fathers themselves, right, are now a little more proactive and they want to take paternity leave, but not everybody uh, seems to be in the giving mood. You know, especially when you have a certain number of days for leave. Like at that time, I remember even if I had 14 or 18 days of leave, it was already amazing. And you imagine adding paternity leave to this equation and telling the person that, oh, I can uh, I can go for paternity leave and I need to. You'll be frowned upon. They'll tell you, oh, we'll mark you down during your, your assessment um, that you have actually been away from work. When you think about it, then you say, uh, never mind, find a way. So this mindset is changing of course 2017 not very far away uh, of this idea of paternity leave before that unheard of but hey why not 
Uh, is the video up? Is it? Are we able to hear it? Um, just uh, one question, Anil, before we move yeah. on to this. Um, yeah. For the last, <clears throat> who are the who are terms as uh, platform workers? Uh, yeah. So, um, if I can just take you to sort of a definition. Okay, so um, typically anyone who is not an employee at the material time is a platform worker if he's working as um, as an, a, a contract as a contractor, independent contractor. Okay, so um, the typical example that I can give you as a worker, a platform worker, is somebody who is working with Grab, for example, uh, who's on the bike and he goes and delivers because such a person is actually not covered by law per se. So he doesn't have an employment contract, he works for contract for service. He basically gets a daily wage or monthly wage or usually he gets a weekly wage at the end of the day with calculations of how much he gets his bonus for. Um, so a platform worker in this circumstance is really the contract for service. If you know the contract of service is the one who's got your full-time contract with a leave, with a uh, medical leave. and uh, the way to distinguish this is actually the Employment Act. If I go to the Employment Act, right, there's a section four, part four, uh, dis distinction of who is covered under an employee in Singapore. And those are the circumstances where you can, there are different classes. It's not a very straightforward class, but someone who earns less than $4,000 or a class of person who earns up to $2,500, $2,600, uh, who is not a seaman, who is not a domestic helper, that category of people uh, generally would have been falling into the employment. Everyone else is basically an independent contractor. Uh, I hope I've addressed this question. I'm going to look for the exact uh, definition because it's not who is a platform worker, but who is not an employee that then becomes an, a platform worker, right? A uh, platform worker really, the, 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 the one person, the one image you have is the guy who wears his hat wearing grab and he's running along in the, on his bicycle. That's typically the person who is going to be your platform worker, right? Someone who sits on Lala Move, who drives his van, right? He's basically a platform worker. Hence, you will see that this is actually a scheme for independent contractors, um, contract for service or people who are working to, to for themselves. They don't report to any particular boss, per se. I hope I've addressed that question somewhat. Um, if there's some more clarification, I'm happy to 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 take to to to, to expand deeper. No worries. I think we are good for now. Okay. Okay. Are we able to load this? No audio again. Okay, no worries. Uh, we can manage this. In short, basically the two weeks has been extended to four weeks and there are certain schemes in which the four weeks has to be uh, extended. Minister didn't talk too much about it. The Ministry of Manpower actually has got a slide on this particular two weeks to four weeks. I, um, I'm just going to focus on those particular points. The two weeks to four weeks simply means that um, you would be able to stagger, if I'm not mistaken, how this is being used for fathers of Singaporean children born from January 1st, 2024. But I understand that in Parliament, Minister actually said that he will start it off from 2023. Uh, that was when the, the 2023 um, Parliament uh, sat for the budget in February. So, um, that for the unpaid infant care leave, what happens is it's double as well uh, for the first two years to 12 days a year instead of six. So, small points to make to note, but big points for HR managers. Why? Because in your handbook, I think you'll now have to go and reflect the new changes uh, for paternity leave and unpaid infant care leave if you have this group of people working in your organization. So this is very important. 
if you are going to be making certain amendments or having it in your letter of uh, appointment or your employment agreement, you would want to ensure that this uh, factor is there. Now, I'll tell you a trick, uh, sort of like a cheat trick that I do. I don't usually put all of the terms inside the paternity leave. I tend to leave it into the handbook or sometimes I indicate that it is according to what the laws of Singapore are in relation to this. Save for leave and um, um, medical hospitalization because that one is quite standard, doesn't change as much. But everything related to co-sharing, to uh, co-development of, uh, of the children's uh, uh, fund and uh, especially when it involves a pregnant uh, uh, employee, then those are basically things that you need to be able to explain to your employee very carefully. You know that, for example, the 16 weeks for a Singaporean uh, or the number of weeks that are going uh, uh, by for others. Of course, the whole idea is to have a Singapore baby. Lah. That's the game plan. Okay. I have um, the next few minutes to talk about this particular category. Is everybody doing fine? Nobody has uh, concussed yet. Nobody has collapsed. Everybody is still here with me. I understand that uh, there are close to 100 people with us today and uh, that you're listening to me patiently. And thank you very much for that patience as we get on to the next uh, stage. Okay, so PWCS, another abbreviation, Progressive Wage Credit Scheme. So ladies and gentlemen, what, what really is this that we are talking about? Um, historically, historically, we actually never considered this Progressive Wage Credit Scheme in the way that it has been discussed now in this budget because um, our idea, your ideology from our old, from our forefathers in Singapore, you know, the, the era was you work hard, you, you, you get support and those who cannot, the government will do a little bit to support you, but at the end of the day, you need to find your own way. And this thinking has changed uh, because of the, of the thinking of how society is feeling this impact of a more expensive, uh, organi more expensive society, more expensive country, and all of these extra things that have an impact on our earning capacity. Doesn't help that 2028, you got financial crisis. 2011, you have sort of a technical recession. And now you have SARS, uh, you have COVID. Uh, of course, you had SARS before that. So all of this means what? It means that your economy needs to be uh, rebooted, your economy needs to be pushed forward, and you need support. So there are going to be a group of people who suddenly fall below. In fact, I'm quite alarmed to read uh, the status in Singapore where people, more and more people are complaining of mental health issues. They are taking it too difficult to, to deal with the stress. And this is something, guys, in HR team, purely out of this, you need to look out for staff who are facing these issues and to be able to have a mechanism to discuss with them. Talking, communicating, because we get isolated with devices, we are going to face this problem where people feel lonely. Please address this issue in your ability to go and as HR managers to talk to your team from time to time. It's just not about emails and WhatsApps. Yeah, it's very important you that you're able to create this environment. Healthcare is a very important uh, feature. Um, if you don't have the right people, the right frame of mind, you're going to have a difficult issue. So coming to this, um, when we talk about progressive claim, my first question is, am I eligible, right? Another great feature is your firm will automatically qualify if you give wage increases to resident employees who A, received CPF contribution. Guess what guys, keywords again. CPF contributions from a single employer at least three months in the preceding year. You have been on the firm's payroll for at least three months and uh, and you've been contributing for the last three months. 
and what has happened is you have an average gross monthly wage increase of at least $100 in the qualifying year. So, so what happens here is that it applies to um, a, cert a certain wage of people. This certain group of people is actually the 2000 uh, the two thousand five hundred dollars to three thousand. This category of people, okay. Uh, the money is basically two thousand five hundred to three thousand. If you increase their salary by at least one hundred dollars in the qualifying year, there will be uh, this PWC scheme qualifying money sending in your direction. So sometimes you wonder, companies wonder why you're receiving monies from the government. Well, it's because of these schemes are obvious, right? Um, always good to have these funds, but at the end of the day, how do we deploy these funds for the benefit of our employees? Is it really just for the benefit of employers? Is it just to reduce my cost? Or is there another active duty in this? On that note, right, I tell you this difficulty I face. It means that at some point of time, um, earning a sum of up to $3,000 may be considered low. It may be considered something that you cannot survive in Singapore. It may be considered as below the poverty line. In fact, in Singapore, I was quite shocked to find out that the poverty line, according to, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Professor Kishore Mabubani, uh, he had indicated that the poverty line is at $2,400 and below. Um, $2,400 or $2,600 and below. Can you imagine, right, what that means? It means that if you earn less than $2,400, you should, you should feel very poor. You can't survive in Singapore. I don't know, um, but that's all statistics based on numbers. I have no clarity, but I can imagine because I feel the cost going up. Let's just talk about um, how this would work, right? The scheme is obviously a co-funding uh, support scheme, right? The co-funding support scheme is is to further uh, so for, for for a certain contribution that is made by by you the certain percentage will be paid by the government so there's a ceiling on the figures i'll just show you this table that is there absolutely right this is the table that that you will see in front of you i know there's a lot of data to absorb all of this you can really read because you have the handout to to refer to when you need to I just wanted to be able to draw your attention that the percentage drops from the qualifying year 2022 to 2026 because the whole idea is to try and increase the wages above a certain amount. So the first year is of course the 2,500 ceiling, starts with 75%, um, and then uh, the second tier is uh, 2,000 to 3,000, it's 45%. Uh, and, and as you can see the numbers, this is what it is. So if I just uh, show you what qualifying wage increase refers to it refers to that's uh, on the side of my slide it refers to my the definition of what gross monthly wage first is it's the total wages basic salary and additional wages such as overtime pay and bonuses but excludes the employer CPF contributions paid by the employer to the employee so obviously it minuses the 17% and then the qualifying wage increase refers to the increase to an employee that qualifies for co-funding in any qualifying year. That's two components. The gross component increase given in that year at least by $100 and two, the gross monthly wage increase given in the preceding year if it is sustained. So you are actually thinking about increasing the amount by the year before and the year forward, what would happen is um, the funding earlier was only 50%. I think it's not a new scheme. It was increased to 75% so that uh, when you increase that amount by a certain amount by $100, for example, the government will support. The government is not supporting the full amount, right? It's saying the first year gross ceiling of 75% of what? So let's be clear what, what, what exactly is the percentage based on? right it is the qualifying wage increase is what you you would get the the, the discount so for example if it's hundred dollars i think what it's saying is the government pays 75 and we pay 25 we the employer pays 25. 
Um, again, this whole idea is to try and increase someone's wage. It's not easy to increase someone's wages from 2,600 to 3,000 or 4,000 immediately. But progressively, you will start seeing that I'm able to increase the wage from 2,005. What is the message? What is the message? The message is, if you're paying your workers between 2,005 to 3,000, hello, please increase your salary for them from time to time. But why? Why must I do this? Well, I'm paying 75% of it, so please increase. What does it tell you? In my mind, it tells you that um, it's not enough. It tells you that my poverty line or my 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 minimum requirement has increased beyond two thousand six hundred dollars. Hence, I'm forcing employers to push their salaries of their staff upwards. Right? My own personal experience is nobody now applies for a job less than three thousand dollars anyway. Right? very very difficult to find staff of that nature i mean those are your own war stories happy to share uh, when you all are able to to tell me a little more but moving on right um i want to be able to give you a small computation but let's just look at how this works so i told you it's about the wage okay this is for information only, co-funding level for the first year, meaning less than 2,500. Multiplied by the increase of the first year, multiplied by the number of CPF contributions in the month. We'll give you a figure. So, number of CPF contributions made by the employer, minimum three months, so times, times 12. Then you just take that difference times 12 and that's what the payout would be. Uh, for the second, it's the same. And if you all are following me, whatever would be the co-funding level in year Level 2, 2,005 to 3,000, multiplied by the increase that I provide, multiplied by the number of CPF contributions. Minimum three months, of course, CPF contributions. Okay? Um, if I take you now, when you get paid, the beauty of all of these schemes that I'm telling you about is that really you don't have to do anything because the payouts will automatically be credited into the employer's gyro bank account your accountant will come to you and tell you hey we receive money most companies right will just take this money and include it into the into their their coffers and say that this is money that they have received at income to net off the expense but from a hr perspective your responsibility excuse me would be to ensure that the the respective category of persons are identified their agreements are correctly identified and updated and that they are on your watch list for whatever category of payments that they are entitled to because your employee will never go to an accountant and say I received this amount. They'll ask the HR, am I supposed to receive? In fact, some of them may not even know that they are entitled to receive this, this kind of uh, increases. Because the mechanism is what? I increase your salary, I increase your CPF. All you know is in your document, you will see exactly that. So let's go to uh, an example. I think I am prompted to uh, look at this and just just a slide before that, I wanted to tell you the qualifying year was if you were paid in 2002, your payout would have been in 2023. The difference here is that it's moved from 50 to 75% as I explained earlier. And therefore 2023 to 2024 in quarter one would have been your payment. All of the payments would have happened in the first quarter. So guys, you need to look out for quarter one January to March when you receive this particular payment for the year before, right? Obvious, huh? So just take note of this uh, understanding and payment directly into the account no need to have magic uh, checks and stuff they don't issue checks anymore so let's start with an example one moment okay <clears throat>
So I start off with an employee who earns $1,800 per month in 2021 and experiences an average gross monthly average increase of $100 in January for each year. Okay, so the table quite nicely summarizes the, or rather the table, the draw, the, the, the chart shows that the person's salary increases by $100 every year. What happens here? 2021, 1,800, 2022, 1,900, 2,000, 2,001. And this is the scheme that's available. And what happens is that following the new scheme, 75%, I'm looking at the table on the left, um, the, explains to you exactly what the difference would be. I would calculate 75% of that, which means it's $75. And then the number would increase for the co-funding. Uh, this whole complicated table is just to show you what the increase would be in a, in a year. I don't need to go through in a lot of details, but if you really need to go and study and you're a little maths person, you need to understand. I think it shows you exactly how the amount would make a difference. Uh, the short of this is my qualifying year for the year before would include both the year, the previous year and this year, two years uh, change, which must mean that um, from a HR perspective, I need to advise my team, I need to advise my bosses, if you increase this, you get a certain credit. If you don't do so, you don't get a credit. So it will be important to go and tell them, please consider increasing your wages so that you can take care of this benefit. It's very important that you understand this because if you don't understand this and you cannot explain to your bosses, they'll ask you, why must I increase? Then you must be able to show them what will be the amount that they would be able to recover by increasing okay there is an argument on the other side as well right let's be honest huh? the argument on the other side is the grant i'm getting is only what amount 75 dollars 150 dollars 60 dollars 60 dollars 30 dollars right these are very small amounts for me considered right but if you look at the if you look at the cumulative payout which is the bottom green portion it will show that that figure is able to offset your employees increment to some extent okay if i'm not making sense over here what i'm really saying is while the amounts jump is very small cumulatively over a period of time in months i actually walk away with a lot, uh, a, a significant amount. So for example, in 2022, I would have walked away with $900 off, although I would have had to pay 25% of that amount. But it allows my employer to realize that his wage has been increased. Two, um, the, the figure increases because I contribute the year and the year before. So if you've done an increase last year, you should do so this year, so that you take advantage of the 2023 uh, um, uh, a plan and then of course it drops to 30 percent which which is again the year before plus this and in total you will see that there is some significant savings as long as you made a contribution for the full year minimum three months of cpm contribution have related for the year for your employee i cannot remember whether there's a cap uh, on the total number of payout but this is something i will check um, but nevertheless this, this is how you would you do so. Uh, example two is really just about the okay, just give me one moment as I right um, right okay uh, if you look at example number two same thought process I have what I've done is um, showed that the difference from 2022 to 2024 is maintained. The scheme for 2020, uh, for, for, for this particular category where we talk about the tier two is affected because it only covers a certain period. This is a person who earns $2,200 per month. Now, uh, do you know what happens 
as to why in my last two categories it is blank. It doesn't have an increment. The answer is very is already there. The real reason for 2025 and 2026 is because 3,000 cap hit. So another clue, right, guys? The hit the government is giving you is um, for those who are caught between two thousand dollars and three thousand dollars. Increase your wages until you get to three thousand dollars, so that you would be entitled to receive a certain grant. Um, the short of things, okay? The formula, the math, and all of this here makes no difference if you don't understand how to inform your bosses what needs to be done. Okay? The short news is provide this particular PWCS so that you would be able to get a grant. But remember, it stops at three thousand dollars. Remember, it stops at a certain percentage. And it reduces the percentage reduces from 30 percent as it gets along so act now that's what the government is saying act now 2022 2023 act now okay uh, you may have one answer right what if in 2022 i never increased but 2023 i did then obviously you'll be eligible only for the 2023 because you never did any increment in 2022 okay i think that part um, more or less i have uh, being able to to address uh, this this issue. Okay, another thing I want to just share with you, which is important over here, is um, tier one and tier two. Tier one and tier two has got one distinguishing factor, and that is in relation to. Uh, what what the figure starts off from okay now if you have someone who earns less than two thousand five hundred dollars you don't apply tier two factors you apply tier one and then someone who increases beyond so you will see that in year 2022 the person had two thousand four hundred dollars in my example 2022 in 2023 the person earned two thousand six hundred dollars and therefore the next category of payments would have applied which is the tier two funding uh, and in tier two funding it would have been 45 percent instead of the 75 percent in tier one understand guys um this math right you all have to work out what is the best formulation uh, for your employers to be able to motivate them a at the same time uh earn some grant it's not an insignificant amount but hey worth thinking if you haven't thought about it in the first place good starting point to think about okay Inquiries, I cannot imagine from this particular course you're walking away going, Wow, Mr. Anil, thank you so much, man. I learned so much, man. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, no, 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 guys. I fully understand there's so much of information that has come in your direction um, that you would probably want to go and reprocess this and reconsider and, of course, look at look at uh, what uh, MOM. In fact, most of you will probably go and search what PWCAS. I never heard this PWCAS and all of these questions. Very good points for you to consider. The decision is never yours. It's of course for bosses to make their decisions, give you directions how to manage, and then of course inform your, um, uh, uh, how to inform your employees about this, okay? So if you take no action, that means no increment at all, no scheme increment at all, right? Nothing happens. You take action to go and make the change, Government automatically verifies. Again, right? Our government very nice. They do all these things for us for whatever reasons. Um, and that one question I will take on straight away. Just give me a moment to take a sip of water. <clears throat> okay. We we are coming to the end of a, a very long session that we've had and in the next few minutes what i hope to do is address some of these questions that could be in your mind and if you have any further questions um, you know please feel free to just uh, shoot it out to me and i'm happy to address them to the best of my ability and if, if i don't have the answers to the question i will look them up and uh, reach out to you uh, to the organizers so that we have complete answers to certain questions so let's start with this question how does the employer verify how does the government verify uh, the, that the wages the company that, that the company uh, employs right 
okay um the short answer to this question is it's of course based on cpf contributions key phrase another theme that has run across our whole talk today is about cpf contributions increase in cpf contributions automatically means that uh, that particular person would trigger a a, a, a scheme it will it will trigger this particular scheme so what happens is that um the the way to I I I I I I'm quite careful how to say this because I'm not suggesting that companies are uh hiring um uh, phantom workers uh, so that I can have CPF contributions but but it is an issue and I'll address this in a second moment um what happens is that employers should not make any mandatory CPF contributions to individuals who are not genuine employees because you actually get this scheme when it sees there's a change in employment and um, we'll address these questions later and i think it's a very interesting point and i'll also share with you what are the problems i have faced with companies um running this to avail to increase our foreign quota um i will talk about it in a couple of minutes i'm sure it's like you're going like foreign quota let me hear this man what mr sun is going to say now but hey let me just tell you in a short while um how does pwc pwcs uh, um Why why does it have a second tier? Well, I think this answer is the truth of the matter is it's of course to increase wages. They need to adjust wages so that overall we can increase it to beyond $3000 and more. That seems to be the message I am getting. I don't know about you. Uh, the whole idea is to move it above the poverty line which I understood was below 2400 or 2600 which must mean that we 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 are trying to encourage as many companies to move forward but this is not a message that has come out very largely no no government is going out and saying come on come on increase your wages but it is done subtly so if you want the grant increase your wages okay why is it been reduced i think i've addressed this it's a transitional scheme it is to provide only support for the first two years clue clue first two years clue clue take advantage of it that's what they're saying because it's going to change uh, downwards so use it use it to your advantage because effectively it's to uh, improve processes why i think a large part of it is covid brought productivity down <coughs> not everybody will agree with me because some people said that productivity actually increased uh, with people working from home having the flexibility but overall the more traditional industries manufacturing um airline productivity has come down because the system has changed and that was very important and critical that um we want to increase people's wages we want singaporeans to be coming into the system and not having to rely on employment there are going to be significant changes in the employment uh, employability of people because technology is going to be a segment in which we all have to be very very focused about you would have seen this in minister tan's uh, discussion and in minister tan's discussion in parliament and in new uh, in the news you would have seen that the focus is to try and ensure that we can bring a certain number of talented foreign workers rather than just any foreign worker uh, to bring in specialized special work or special pass holders not just any ordinary work uh for for work force why quality of work needs to increase technology is removing all of the mundane work that's important okay now um while while we talk about abuses of pw uh, cs uh, the progressive wage i want to share with you two stories um First of course I let me take my own Mr Ang now Mr Ang decides to be the grab driver that he wants to be so that he's got his time and Mr Ang has now realized that there's some protection for him so he's got some comfort and um, he's also retiring early or he's going to be coming to a, t- a stage above 70 at some point of time where he doesn't want to work anymore so my 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 Mr Ang Chiho is come to a stage where he has seen all of these changes 
But of late, you may have also realised that there are a lot more people scamming the government with these schemes. Right? And anyone who honestly goes on and follows the system, no issue. But anyone who takes advantage of this system, I think the first thing they will do is to literally attack you on um, on, on the criminalness of such offences. Let me tell you what I'm talking about, okay? Um, I advise quite a few companies on matters related to this because everybody is trying to increase the number of workers that can come in. I just want to alert everybody, there is a change in the way that these workers are going to come to Singapore. Um, there's already a change in criteria. There's increase in the minimum wage that you can pay, whether for an employment pass holder or for an S pass holder. Um, and of course, when you talk about a, 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 a wage earner, uh, someone who's on a work permit, even that amount has gone up. Um, these are all considerations for something which we are trying to avoid and that is the serious view in which the government takes on the abuse of these schemes. I don't only use this particular scheme but all schemes um, where what happens is that they they are supposed to receive the particular money and the way that they do this is to go and split the companies into two, into various companies, multiple companies. Uh, don't think that the government doesn't know this, right? Um, I know you'll have a question for me. Are you saying that I cannot work in two jobs, right? Uh, yes, you can, but you need to be having that pay from that one single employer. So in other words, if you work two jobs of $2,200 or $2,400 a month, you need to get $2,200 from each employee each employer to be able to qualify uh, per se but there are compli complications in that particular computation um, the other thing is that to as i use the word having phantom workers created these people don't go to the office they just sit there to increase numbers for you and what you do is that from time to time you increase their wage salary and then from time to time they get extra wages actually this guy do nothing they don't come to the office at all uh, this is quite prevalent. I've seen this. I've seen this happen quite a few times. And um, what ultimately occurs is that uh, MOM officers doing checks and realizing the particular office is not there. Let me tell you a story, another story. Um, and this one I actually represented in court. I had gone, I, I this particular person, this is several years before some of these changes have been made to CPF. This particular person was the general manager and the general manager needed to get a couple of chefs, cooks, to come and cook in, in a particular place in, in I, I won't say too much, I'll just say Little India, um, in, in Singapore at Sarangun, and Little India Sarangun Road. And what happened was, this particular manager, he was given a form by another supervisor, I suspect a very clever, cunning supervisor, who signed off his, his um, workers. Uh, some of them were Singaporean, some of them foreign workers, and he just signed it off uh, because he says, yeah, these are the workers he confirmed. But he didn't see the Singapore workers because he was told these workers worked in different parts, were doing marketing, doing whatever it was. One day, um, of course, enforcement officers came to the restaurant and when they went into the restaurant they realized that these workers were not working in the premises uh, no such worker actually existed at the premises other than the fact that you were making cpf contributions there was no other trace of them anywhere close needless to say that was considered a fraudulent arrangement clear fraudulent right fraud right and uh, and uh, Unfortunately, right, it was not the bosses that took the toll, who took the the, the the liability for it. Neither was it the supervisor. It was the person who signed, my client, who was a general manager. And he had two children. And when we went to court, to appeal to court, to tell the court, please, Your Honor, 
um, this is an error because our client didn't know. He really didn't know that there were non-workers inside there. You know what the court said? The court said, too bad. Your so-and-so client signed the document. He recognized that there were these workers that were there and he claims that these, these workers were there. And therefore, his representation is enough to charge him personally as the office manager, general manager of the place. We pleaded, we did a lot. Ultimately, until today, this haunts me. Um, this general manager went in for three weeks. Okay? Three weeks, jail. Um, we fought a lot to try and get this off. But, um, and you know what's the most embarrassing thing for a person of this nature? This is a gentleman who's got full head of hair, you know, a thick moustache, and uh, and he was, uh, he was uh, you know, very pious, religious person. Ultimately, they had to shave him both. They had to shave his moustache. And um, he was basically pious, he was vegetarian. He didn't have much option and he had to go in for three weeks. I, I feel for this kind of story because basically he was taken advantage of, to be honest. I, I found that to be really, really, it's troubled me quite a bit. And so I tell all bosses and I tell everyone, look, at the end of the day, you need to make sure you walk on the righteous path. You need to make sure because your employers, employees depend on you for your uh, for your success and progress. They put their life, their blood, their sweat. So please make sure that the organization, of course, the company is also charged, but how much was it going to be paying? The director at the end of the day, the office manager took the button for all of the pain. Another one is making mandatory CPF contributions for wages without expectation of work to be done. Uh, similar to my situation, um, of course, you know, these are all the typical abuses. Or making purported mandatory CPF contributions for inflated wages that are not commensurate with the volume of work. Uh, this is typical in foreign circumstances. Um, I have just recently saw a client coming and telling me, I didn't hire the particular person um, or rather this one was not the hire the person this was the I paid a certain amount of money on paper but actually I sorry let me get my thought correct I paid a higher amount on paper but actually I pay him a much lower sum okay automatic case uh, it will automatically go to one in which MOM can charge and in some circumstances I have seen them charge and they have to deal with these circumstances straight away. There's no defense because you show their paperwork and your paperwork will show that the particular person is supposed to receive, for example, 2,200, but you pay the person 1,500, almost like a cash back arrangement. Okay. Okay, um, this one is less common, but it's still there. Continuing to pay mandatory CPF contribution for employees who are actually retrenched, asked to go. But on paper, I say you put on no pay leave. Okay, this can happen by accident. Person is actually no longer working over there. You don't want to pay retrenchment benefits. You make the person pay on no pay leave and ask the person to be on the system because you pay the CPF contributions and you can get your numbers. Happens, I don't see it very often, but maybe you have experience please take note of these abuses, okay? Um, I, I I now talk about the, the last one. Uh, CPF contribution based on past wages for employees who have suffered wage cuts. So you're supposed to be paying the lower wage, but you actually pay the higher wage. Also, this considered to be, maybe there are mitigating factors why the lower wage is there, all right? We've hit, um, We've hit almost the end of our uh, session. If I may take a couple of minutes now, one or two minutes, just to conclude our comments. We started off um, the day talking about CPF contributions, support measures, and progress wage credit. If I can summarize this, very quickly in the two minutes that I have. In CPF credit, recognize the two dates, September 23 and subsequently 1st of January, 
where CPF rates will change. One, key point, right? Support for various class of people. If you decide to employ someone with a disability or a senior worker or a person who is a platform worker, there are schemes in place, please do so. The PWC as in short, uh, I'm actually hinting to you, please do go and suggest to increase because you get the highest amount. I'm not forcing or asking anyone to consider, but if you do the math, it may make sense that the government pays 75% of that increase to motivate your staff to realize that they are getting a higher salary now. Because as you go down the list, the amount will become less. It's a transitionary remedy for people who can take advantage of this. It calculates automatically. IRAS already does so, but you need to take the first step. Okay. Um, in all of these schemes, you realize the grand scheme of thing is there is a CPF contribution in which becomes your marker. So obviously your CPF markers are important. In all of the changes, whether it's parent, whether it is, uh, uh, sorry, whether it's paternal or whether it's the infant care or if it's any of the schemes, you need to ask yourself whether you need to make changes in your employment agreement and your employment handbook because these changes are not there before. They are enhancements, they need to be made, they need to be updated, clear, right? Um, I also think it's very critical in terms of, of our concluding comments that as HR practitioners, payroll, you may need to go and nudge your employers, your bosses, that these schemes are available for us to take advantage. Automatically, a boss will tell you, oh, can you please go and find out more about it? Because if I can take, I will apply and then instruct you to go and do so. That is exactly the process you want. And in that process, please also inform and educate your team about the various abuses that can occur, whether in the PWCS scheme or whether it's related to um, uh, uh, the, the kind of hiring that you do in relation to discrimination or uh, retirement because these three things are triggers in your organization that can cause an issue okay so in summary the budget the singapore budget this year has been a little more forward thinking a little more generous a little more credit based to be able to take advantage of of um, weaknesses in our system because of COVID, right? Moving forward, you can see that the rates have tapered down, right? You saw in the CPF schemes, uh, the numbers are coming down for a certain group of people because my focus is to bring employers, right? My focus is to bring employers to, uh, uh, to bring senior employees to come onto my platform, to bring other people into my platform, to increase my workforce. And that seems to be the trend that we're moving towards at the end of all of this exercise, right? And one final thought, I think on my part is having presented this seminar and gone through the material and understanding where the government was coming from, I learned that um, the benefit this year was about empowering employees. That must mean that now HR people must know exactly what they're dealing with. This is not just you sitting down and preparing items and trying to interview people or, or preparing your, your, your next candidate. No, it's trying to understand the workforce you have at the moment, if I can say that. Okay. Uh, on this note, I um, have taken a lot of your time to be able to share with you as much as I can in the most concise possible way. Um, I leave you with some questions for discussion, okay? And really talk freely because this is really where we can learn and whether we can make any changes as HR professionals. So my thoughts or rather unlocking certain thoughts is are there any specific measures in the Singapore budget that you think 
can particularly help in managing your company's workforce? One. First, first question to this, huh? Second is, if you think there's been a positive impact on your overall business environment, I can think in terms of money, but maybe you have other ways. And if so, how do you see this translating in your organization? And three, how do you plan to communicate the implications of budget to your employees and employers and ensure that they are aware of any relevant changes? In fact, I'll ask this other part as well. Why must I do so? It's purely for the purposes of communicating change. Mindset change. With that, and for all your time and patience listening to me, I thank you for this time and presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Anil. I'm sure everybody has learned a lot from your session today. So um, if you have any questions, okay, feel free uh, to drop us in uh, the question and uh, question box, then we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Okay.